And we are continuing in the book of Matthew. And as we continue in the book of Matthew, Jesus continues to talk about his kingdom. And his kingdom is very different than how the world operates. How is it different? Instead of it being self-centered, self-focused, Jesus is talking about a kingdom that is very different in that it should be though when people are mean to you, you are kind to them. When there is evil that goes on, the, in, the, on in the world, you mourn about it. You, you are generous. You are promoters of peace. And so it is a very different idea than how people are living in their everyday life. And... One best way to maybe illustrate that or to think about that, has anybody ever been overseas? And when you were overseas, there was a custom or a tradition that just, they did differently. And you're like, well, in America, we don't do that. But over there, it was common and expected. I remember being over in, in China, and when I was over there, um, the person of honor, and being a foreigner, they said, all right, you're the person of honor. They would tend to give some of the more uh, choice foods. And, and, and being that way, they offered me the brain of a duck, that's one thing, but then I had chopsticks, and, and I just, uh, I wish I could do that. I just didn't know how, and I said, well, I thank you, but in America, we don't eat this, and I didn't want to offend them, but also, I also didn't want to eat duck brain. But uh, there's other things, and, and one of the illustrations that I, I've heard that probably best illustrates that. Uh, have you ever been to a country where they drive on the wrong side of the road? Maybe England, and, and you drive there, and, and you're like, this is just weird. This is unique. This is different than what I know. This is different than what I'm accustomed to. Well, yeah, I mean, you just can imagine all the accidents, maybe from tourists going over there and just naturally wanting to take that gun on the you know, right-hand side and take the right-hand turn and all that. And... and, and you look at that and you go, that's different. And what happens is, Jesus is calling his people to act differently. So imagine today, if all of us said, all right, we want to agree to live differently, and we're all going to drive on the left-hand side of the road. And we all said, all right, this is how we're going to live. We're going to live just counterculture. We're going to live. And we pull out here. We just start driving on the, on the left side of the road. What would happen? There'd be a chance for some collisions. And, it, and then you're really going to start to wonder when then those that are driving the, the rescue vehicles are even driving on the other side of the road. And then, and then it's just everything's going to be chaos. And it's going to fear with what people, how people want to operate. That's what's happening here as we look at it. Jesus is calling people to live differently. And as he is calling people to live differently, it's coming in conflict or in a clash with what's going on, especially with, concerning the Pharisees. And they don't want anything to do with what Jesus is saying. And so there's this conflict that kind of arises. And so right here we are. And this is really, you could imagine, Jesus starts to talk about how to live out kingdom life. And that's very counter to what the Pharisees had been trying. Because they'd been living there, they'd been trying to live out life. And, and not only did they take the rules from Scripture... But they just kept on adding and adding and debating about it. What does it mean to do work? Is, is, is work, you could write two letters, but you couldn't write three letters. That was considered work. Maybe if you didn't write it in something permanent, maybe you wrote it in the ground or in the dirt, that was okay. And so then the Pharisees were just adding on layers and layers of law that Jesus never even taught here. And so Jesus is going, all right, this is the heart of, of what was given in the Old Testament. And understand that I have come to fulfill it. Every part of this is important. Every part is valuable. Don't pass over it. God's word is true and it will be fulfilled in, in, in whether in Christ or in other ways. And that's what Jesus is coming to announce. 
And so you could imagine those that had spent energy building up this facade that it is going to come in conflict, it's going to come to a clash. And I thought one way to illustrate that is with apples. Now, both of these apples look really good. However, they've also been sitting in our refrigerator for a while. Now, you could go, all right, I'm going to bite into this apple. And how many has bit into an apple or maybe an orange? And the second you bite into it, you go, man, this is mealy. It's brown. It's just kind of maybe with an orange. It just, it's just real. The pulp is just all there and no juice. You go, it looked good on the outside, but this is worthless. There's nothing. I, you know, you typically go, all right, and you either... If, if, you're not overly hungry, you'll just completely throw it out. But it could look exactly like a good apple. And so what Jesus is saying, all right, we, I'm going to look at the heart. I don't, it's not about the external appearance. In fact, the external appearance, if it's a facade, don't be that way. But make a be about the heart. And he's been talking about that even from within the Old Testament. He's talking about this new covenant that, that, that will come. And people are looking forward to it. However, they have gotten distracted. In fact, there, there are two ways that Jesus addresses, the, uh, or two that he addresses on the Sermon on the Mount. One way he addresses, and you can see this throughout Scripture, is those that are pure in heart, those that are, seek righteousness, and within their heart, they're following after God because what God has done. There is a true love, a true genuineness about them. And then he's addressing another group of people, which tends to be the Pharisees that probably are around and listening to some of this. And those that are externally, they, they go to the temple and, and they pray aloud to be heard and be seen as righteous. And when they give money, they give their money to be seen. And he's saying, that's not how I want you to live. That's not how scripture has called you to live. He's called you to live pure in heart. And so he's going to, through this Sermon on the Mount, he's going to consistently go through it. And, and you'll just look again and again. You know, he's not talking about, you know, those that believe and those that don't believe, which is sometimes what you see through Scripture. But on the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's addressing kind of the Pharisees and the people that had held on to the law and kind of gone further than what God had told them to go and kind of have distorted it. And he's calling them back to what it really looks like to be part of the kingdom. And so and that's kind of the setup that we have going on here. And so let's continue on. So we're in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. It says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, co I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So People are thinking this, that, that he's come to abolish. And the word abolish means kind of to tear down, maybe a wall, to, to demolish it, to take it apart. Don't think that I've come to do that. And he's probably addressing that because people are kind of going, what's he talking about? Is he going to do away with what's in the Torah, what's in the, in the teaching? And, and again, when it says law, what it's talking about, it's talking about the teachings of Jesus. It's talking about the teaching uh, that is in the Old Testament given to the prophets. And, and it's talking about the whole Old Testament when he's talking about the law. And particularly the, when it talks about the law, it can just be talking about the Ten Commandments. Or it could be talking about just the wider range, the 613 of them that he's addressing. Uh, so, but with this, when he talks about the law or the prophets, he's probably referring to all of the Old Testament, the teachings that are within that. He has not come to abolish them, but he has come to fulfill them. And, and, and as you think about that, that fits right in line where some of the things that we have seen in Scripture as far as what he was talking about, about a, a, a new way coming, a new covenant. And probably the best that illustrates that is Jeremiah 31, 31. And let me go ahead. You can turn there. And it says this, Jeremiah 31, 31. It starts off this way. 
Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So there, even in the Old Testament, when they were under Old Covenant law, and how did they, how did they do in living out the law that was given at Mount Sinai? How did they do? Did they, did they really do well? No, they failed and they failed again and again and again. And in fact, Jeremiah is writing this. They had failed and they all got kind of been sent off into exile. And while they're in exile, he kind of gives this, uh, this message to them. Hey, see that you failed, but there's something that I'm going to do. I'm going to do something different. And he declares that he's doing, that he is the Lord and he's going to make a new covenant. And obviously, if you hear this and you're in exile, you're anticipating this. You're wanting this to happen because you see that the way you've been working isn't really working out, especially if you're in captivity. A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with your fathers on the day when I took them by the hand, bringing them out of the land of Egypt. All right. So that we're, we're looking at all that we had talked about in the book of Exodus. And then my covenant that they broke. All right. So, it was, so it's clear. And what was the purpose of the covenant when it was established at Mount Sinai? We'll look at it a little bit more. But it was to so, show that his people couldn't actually live it out. They needed something more. They needed to follow after God. And, and, and God sees that and says, all right, you can't live it out in and of yourselves. I'm going to do something else. And he says, uh, you broke my covenant. Um, though, I was your, uh, though I was their husband, declared the Lord, for this is the covenant I will make in the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put the, my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and they, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. People, and so he's talking about a new covenant where it's not just external laws that said, "All right, keep up to this." And in fact, we see that they couldn't keep up to it. But it's going to be different. He's going to put it within their heart. And as he does that, they're anticipating that. And we kind of, we see that actually unfold in our lives. If you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what it means when you've trusted and you've believed in Jesus Christ, where God has is, is, is changed your heart. You've been made anew. You're born again. That you can see that change in God working within you and through you as you put the, whole, the promise of the Holy Spirit within you. And so... We see this even kind of talked about in, in the New Testament. But what happens is people come to this passage and they're reading right here in Matthew and they kind of get distracted and they go, all right, I haven't come to abolish the law. And they, and they read the kind of a, a, probably a wrong interpretation and go, all right, he hasn't abolished the law. So as, as believers, we need to go ahead and keep every uh, commandment that's here in the, in the Old Testament. And we need to go ahead and we need to keep the food law, the dietary laws. We need to keep some of the, the cleaning laws and all of that. And they say, all right, I'm going to try to live that out following all the commands that are in the Old Testament. Now, most of you, you, you don't do that. But if you think about it, what's happening for a group and a people with the Pharisees right there, that's just got to be really hard to swallow. Because here you have people that are coming from all around, all different places, coming to listen to Jesus. And, and there are some Gentiles that are coming there listening to him too. And, he's like, and they're like, well, I, I understand that, that you have a problem e eating pork, but I don't have a problem. And, and so you could imagine the debate and the controversies that would go on with that. And he's like, all right, I'm going to create a new covenant. And, and Jesus goes ahead and, and shows it. And he says, you know, again, if, if all those things were, were to be kept, every little part of it, keeping all the festivals and everything like that, you would think that Jesus would spend time uh, kind of in the New Testament kind of explaining how we as a church should be living it, that out each and every part of our life. But he doesn't. And so we see things like that. 
um, like here in uh, Romans 10.14. So it says, For Christ is the end of the law uh, for righteousness to everyone who believes. And, and so it's just talking about, all right. So there is a sense, a transition from living under the Mosaic covenant to living under uh, the covenant that God goes ahead and is established when Jesus Christ dies on the cross for our sins. And it continues on in Galatians 3, 23 through 25. It says this, Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So they, they knew that something was going to be revealed. So when, so then the law was our uh, guardian until Christ came. So the law is good. The law was a guardian. The law showed that here, this is the character of God. This is the nature of God. These are important to know who God is. And it also shows that you can't live it out. And so it, it, it's kind of it's described as a tutor or guardian in order that we might be justified by faith. So all of this was pointing in the Old Testament to Jesus and what he would do on the cross. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. How's it different? The law is written in our hearts, just as it talked about in the Old Testament. So we see the fulfillment come with Jesus. And then in Ephesians uh, 2.15, obviously you've got to look at this and, and, and understand it through the right lens. It says, By abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in obedience, that he might create in himself one new man taking the place of two, so making peace. So, again, it's not just his chosen people. And again, it never really was in the, in the Old Testament. It was for Jews and Gentiles, but his special favor was upon the Jews. And now he's saying, all right, now there's a new covenant with both Jews and Gentiles. And with that new covenant, I am putting my spirit within their hearts. So I have come, I have fulfilled it. And I am making, I am making a way. And so... As we think about him fulfilling the Old Testament, what do, we, what do we look at when we talk about fulfill? There's two ways to fulfill a law. Think about that. All right, let's say you're pulling up to a stop sign. You're, and there's two ways. Let's say you can fulfill it by A, stopping at it, right? Put up the next slide. So you can A, you can do it by keeping it. You're keeping the law. You, you go ahead, you stop at the stop sign, and then, you, and then you come to a complete stop, and then you go on. At that point, the police officers can't say, hey, I'm going to arrest you or, or give you a ticket because you didn't stop at the stop sign. He can't do that because you actually stopped. Now, the other way that it can be fulfilled, that law, is let's say you, you didn't stop, you just ran through it, and the police officer gave you a ticket. Now, you're before the judge, and you go ahead, say, I'm guilty, I did that, it says here's a fine, and you pay the fine. Now, once you paid the fine, can the judge come back after you? No. So what we have here is, is we have Christ, and in his example, how did he fulfill the law? Well, Christ fulfilled it in two ways. He didn't sin. He kept it perfectly and completely. And then he died on the cross for our sins. So that when we believe in him, when we trust in him, it, we can, when we are following after him, we can no longer be seen as guilty, but we go before the Lord and God sees his righteousness, not our righteousness. And that is offered to all who trust, all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are the kind of the two ways as you look at the law being fulfilled is one, you, you keep the law. And can anybody keep the whole Old Testament and all the laws that are given? No. But Christ did. 
And so then, not only did he keep him perfectly, and he, is, he didn't try to keep the pharisaical laws, just the, the, what God had actually given, and then he also went ahead and died on the, cry, on the cross for our sake, that we could have life in him. So hopefully he's getting at that and he's talking about that because he wants the people around to understand what's going on. How does what he's talking about fit along with what's in the Old Testament? In fact, he continues on and he's valuing the, what is in the Torah, what is in the prophets. And he says this, I say to you, until heaven and earth or, or for, I tru for, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Uh, and some people probably in your translation have dot or tittle. Um, what it's talking about is just the littlest of marks. And that would change the meaning of a word. It would change how it is read or done. And, and, and kind of the jot is kind of like maybe, like even in the, maybe a little, just a little character, like a dot on an I. And then, and then the, the iota or the tittle is kind of, make, kind of like coming up on it. It was just a little extra mark that some different letters in the Hebrew have that kind of differentiate that one letter from another. It's like not any little part that's there that shouldn't be there. God put it all there for his purpose, his glory. I'm not changing it. I have come to fulfill it. It is important. It's valuable. And, and how true that is today to remember this. People will go, oh, there's no need to study the Old Testament. Well, yes, there is. It's important to know it and to study it and to understand what it says. Why? Well, one, you're learning about who God is and his character. And number two, you're going to understand the New Testament so much better because the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. It's put, pointing to the redemptive history that God has had in place from before time. And so you know who God is. And as you know more intimately who God is, you're going to have a deeper relationship with him. And as you have a deeper relationship with him, you're going to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth and follow after him and, and, and give him the glory that is due to him. And so he continues on in, in, in this. And he says, Therefore, whoever... Uh, relax uh, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, I will call least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them all will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, he, he's again pointing to all of, all of this. The, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand, and that is how we're supposed to be living out. And last week we talked about that we are living life out from a state of victory in saying, I have been forgiven, I have been redeemed, and in that, because of what God has done, it gives me joy to serve and to follow after God. How different then... All right, I've got to be good enough for God. I've got to do enough to please God. Very different, very, very contrast because you, you're always working, you're always striving, going, all right, did I do good enough? Can I, can I, can I earn God's favor anymore? That's going to end up to kind of a, almost a spiral down because ultimately we're told that we can't. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He lived the life we couldn't live and he died on the cross. So that when we die, we're presented before uh, the Father as, as cleansed, as righteousness. And so it's God, Jesus' righteousness that God the Father sees and not our own. So all of this continues to point to, to the value and the importance of God's word. So this is kind of point number two that I want you to take home today. Know God's word. Know the Old Testament. Know the New Testament. It's important. It is valuable. Study it. Know the character of God. And that kind of comes to the second point that I just want to make sure that, I, I, that you take home with you today. And it's kind of stated in a weird way in, in verse 20. It says, 
For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, to a people, an audience at that time, they knew that they couldn't do that. They couldn't. There were so many laws and so many regulations that the scribes and the Pharisees had heaped up, and they're looking at that going, I can't do that. But in a sense, what Jesus is saying is, how they're living is not how I've called you to live. I've called you to live a righteous life, and that's not on a basis of what you can do or what you can earn, but it's a basis on what Christ has done. And that was foretold from the beginning of time that Christ would come and, and, and he would be victorious. And in that, he would put a new, uh, uh, give you a new heart. Instead of a heart of stone, he'd give you a heart of flesh. So you could follow after him. And it's not on the basis of what we do, but what he has done. And so he's taking what the, 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 what the, the people there are looking at and saying, that's religious. And what is he doing? Call them whitewashed sepulchers. He's calling them, you know, they're, they're like that apple that you take a bite into and it's just mealy and not good for anything. He's saying true righteousness comes out of an outflow of the heart of one who has trusted and has believed in me. So you can't kind of even live up to that, the, the false standard that the scribes and Pharisees have set in place. You can't do that. The only way in which you can live and, and have, kind of have this evident of your, in your life that he's talking about and as he deals about uh, anger and lust and divorce and oaths and all of that, he's saying the only way that you can live out this kingdom life is by believing and trusting in me. I will give you a new heart. And so we'll continue just to see that unfold. But the two ways that we can obey the law, that people could try to obey the law, is kind of like this pharisaical obedience, which ultimately is, is, uh, leads to nothing. It ends, well, it leads to more than nothing. It, lends to, it leads to punishment in hell for eternity. He says, I don't want that. I want grace-motivated obedience. And that, that's, that's where he wants. He wants us to live and to hear the law, which is, is God's teaching his word. And he wants us to hear that and go, I know what I've been forgiven of. And because I've been given so much and forgiven, I want to share that with others. Instead, instead of building a kingdom about myself, I want to focus on building Christ's kingdom which is marked by love, by peace, by generosity. And it's not on, I need to do this in order to be good. It's, I have been accepted, I have been forgiven, I, I have been redeemed, and that is how I want to live my life out because I know the system of the world brings no value to, to eternity. And I want to go ahead and to worship God and to give him glory and to give him honor. And so that's the second part that I want you to take home with you. is just that notion of as we live out our life that we are doing it in such a way where Christ is exalted. And in fact, I just want to kind of step through this a little bit more and just, you know, it says um, in verse 21, you have heard it said uh, to those of old, you shall not murder, but whoever murder is liable of judgment. But I say to you, uh, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable uh, to, to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable uh, to hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, remember your brother has done something against you. Leave your gift before the altar. First, go reconcile to your brother. And when uh, coming to the officer, offer a gift, come to terms quickly with the accuser while you're going uh, with him in court. Least the accuser can be over... Uh, 
to judge and to judge the guard and uh, you be put in prison, truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So what he's saying is, all right, there is a, 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 a righteousness that is set in place that you can't meet. You, I, has anybody ever in their heart kind of been angry at something and somebody and said, you know, there, there's righteous anger and we, and we can look at that. But has anybody in their heart gone ahead and said, all right, I have anger, I have contentment to that person and you value them less than God values them? You ever done that? It's like, no, don't do that. They have value. I see the value in them. I know the value that they have. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know the hardships that they've had. Let's, let me um, go ahead and give an example. Let's say you had two acorns. See, little acorns. And one of them you went ahead and you put into the dirt. What happened? You grow up and become a strong tree. Then you had the other acorn and you put it on the, pa on the pavement. What would happen over time? Kind of break apart and deteriorate and it would never become a tree. Now, was either of the acorns deficient in any way or any manner? No. They weren't, were they? What you see is it's the difference of, of what soil they landed on. So you can't go, all right, I am better than you because of this. Because all of us were made in the image of God. And as we're made in the image of God, one person has no greater value than another person because they're both made in the image of God. One person has, has had different soil to land on. And it grows. And so it's not of your own doing that you can say, hey, look at how good I am. Look at how, how amazing I am. But it all comes back to the fact that what God has done. You say, oh, I, 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 I've never murdered anybody. And hopefully nobody ever in here has. But the person that has murdered somebody... You don't know what type of life they've gone through. You don't know the torment that they experience in life. You don't know what they grew up with in the pain and the hurt. And so God looks at them and says, I value them. I love them. And he's calling us to treat them with the same love and compassion that God has for each and every one of us. And so... You can, you can imagine just the, the anger and vitriol that the, that the Pharisees and the scribes would have because they've worked their whole life to create this system of this is how you live out righteously. And Jesus goes, no. What's in the heart? Don't treat anybody with contempt. Well, do you think the Pharisees went ahead and treated people with contempt? Probably. They're probably angry at Jesus. They're like, and they were. They're like, Jesus, who are you talking to? You're talking to sinners. You're talking to prostitutes. You're talking to tax collectors. You're talking to people who aren't keeping the dietary guidelines. Why are you doing that? They have no value. God goes, no, they do. Because I've created them. And I've gone to them. And the kingdom of heaven is available for them. It's available for you. Trust and believe in me. Understand that the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Understand that the New Testament, it points to Jesus. It points to the work that he did on the cross. And our worth and our value is in the worth and the value that God has given us. And so in that, we come before God and we say, thank you. Thank you. And our lives model that of being thankful for what God has done. And out of that outflow, it's no longer burdensome to be a, a person who issues peace. 
who lives out relationships, encouraging and building one another up. In fact, when you do that as a believer, there's great joy that comes into your life. And that's how he's calling us to live. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying the Old Testament is important, it's valuable, and not only, not only that, I have come to fulfill it, and this is what fulfillment of that looks like. It looks contrary to the world. It's that of peace, it's that of love, it's that of generosity. And my people will be marked by that. So... What, a, what an amazing truth. What, a, what an amazing burden that can be lifted off your shoulder. So if you're here today and you, and you read these things and you go, I can't do it. I can't live this way. Good. Good. The law was given to show our transgression. Turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, Thank you for living the life I couldn't live. Thank you for fulfilling what the Old Testament talked about. Thank you for, for living the life I couldn't live. And thank you for dying on the cross. I trust in you. I believe in you. And out of that, when you do that, when you tr trust in Jesus, this weight is lifted off because it's no longer about performance. It's no longer about trying to look good. Because you have been declared righteous by Christ. So trust in Him. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord, just thanking Him for what He has done in our lives. Lord, we do come before You. We do thank You for the love that You have given us. Oh Lord, I pray for, for anybody that's here that has sought to, to live a life out of, out of trying to meet all the requirements of the law, trying to do everything right, thinking that living by not killing, by not murdering, by, by, by not stealing is going to earn them a way into heaven. I pray that they would see that that doesn't work. I pray that they would trust in you that they would believe in, in your finished work. Lord, I also pray for believers that have trusted in you, but somewhere, something, you know, something distorted uh, what you had said and, and what you talk about in Scripture. And they don't feel good enough. They don't feel uh, that they can even come before you in prayer. Lord, I pray that they would see that you have forgiven them. That you call them to yourself. That you continue to offer forgiveness. That that, that mercy and grace that they had received at the, the moment they had, that they had trusted in you is still there. Lord, we thank you thank you for the law. We thank you for the teachings within it. We thank you how it reveals who you are and the grace and the love and the peace that you do offer. Help us as we seek to be those of your kingdom, living in a world that, that doesn't value, in fact, even attacks believers. Help us to live out a way of continually demonstrating love and mercy and grace. In your name we do pray. Amen.